finished. And there's a problem with my own. Did she survive? Did Okay, well, <coughs> we'll get started now. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name's Richard Philpott. This is F.A. Ridley. And uh, before we get going, I'll just say that uh, the reason this uh, meeting lecture was requested by Frank originally was as a result of uh, a lecture in March on the 100th anniversary of the death of Karl Marx when Frank came to speak here about the uh, life and writings of Marx and on, on that occasion uh, the ro this room was absolutely packed out and we couldn't actually get any more people in here and so uh, Frank kindly offered to speak on Spartacus and the slave revolutions of antiquity and in fact uh, Leslie Jones over here has got some copies of Frank's book on Spartacus which is the only uh, historical study in English on the subject uh, he also has copies of other works of Frank. Uh, that's the future of the British monarchy. There's also three lunar voyages, Pope John and the Cold War, and uh, it's Celestial, Celestial Visitor. Visitor. Uh, um, <coughs> before, before I ask Frank to start, I um, should say that uh, if anybody at the back can't hear Frank, could they just say so and I'll ask Frank to speak up. And after Frank has spoken for about three quarters of an hour, uh, and then we'll have Frank's offered to answer any questions, queries relating either to the period of Spartacus and slave revolutions of antiquity, or indeed relating to the Spartacist uh, movements in Europe in the 20th century. Um, so when we come to uh, questions, um, Frank's hearing is very poor, so if you, people could speak up, and then if Frank can't hear uh, the questions, I'll repeat them for him. Okay, Frank, do you want to...? Well, Mr. Chum, on the 14th of March, I spoke here on the influence and personality of Karl Marx, and I uh, made a number of references to uh, revolutionary movements. Can you speak up, Frank? The um, history of revolution is a very long one, and it goes back far beyond the time of Karl Marx. Uh, with the disappearance, <coughs> or primitive society in which wealth or poverty at least was held in common. With the development of classes and the class society, the era of revolution may be said to have begun. And um, tonight, I propose to deal with some of the movements, the early movements of the revolutionary sequence. In the first place, one that must remember that the society of antiquity, that is the society prior to about four or five hundred AD, was a slave society, and the slaves were the principal exploited class. There was, of course, the wealth and poverty. There were divisions of opinion and divisions of uh, political views and so on among the free classes. But the basic distinction of in ancient society was between the free class, who were legally free, and the slave class, who were legally enslaved, <coughs> and who were mere chattels of, of the ruling class. The slave class made repeated efforts to, to overthrow the existing ruling class, of which the rising of Spartacus in 73 or 71 BC was probably the most important and certainly much the best known. But uh, Spartacus did not begin the revolutionary sequence. The revolutionary sequence began long before Spartacus. 
Before, before briefly repeating or reciting a number of the movements which preceded the Spartacus Rising, one may make one or two general observations on the nature of revolution in antiquity as contrasted with the revolutions of modern times. In the first place, there was of course the fact, the fact I've already mentioned, that the revolutionary class in antiquity was a slave class. The, there was a proletarian proletariat of antiquity, and it had its political struggles. But this proletariat was legally a free class and does not concern my, my subject tonight. The major revolutions of the period were, were made by the, by the slave class. So, uh, furthermore, the aims of ancient revolution were different from those of modern times. Uh, modern revolutions were made in the Third World or made in Russia or in China or in, in 19th century in Western Europe, in France, Germany, and in the 17th century in England and so on, were revolutions made by a revolutionary class against another, revolu uh, another non-revolutionary class which was in power. For instance, the Cromwellian Revolution in the 17th century was a, re a revolution made by the merchant class, by the middle class, um, against the feudal nobility and the power of the monarchy, which was uh, for a time abolished in this country. In antiquity, the situation was quite different. Revolutions did not uh, look forward to the future. Uh, they did not uh, produce, uh, indicate that a new society could be developed as a result of changes in the in methods of production or in the methods of the social order. In antiquity, they look back to a golden age in the past. Uh, therefore, the revolutions of antiquity were backward looking. They all look back to some remote age of gold, which in the Jewish Bible is known as the Garden of Eden, um, and which, which is known by other names in other countries. Uh, in, in particular, there was a utopian movement about the third century BC, which produced a work which has now disappeared, known as the Sun State, which indicated that a period had existed when they, everybody had been free and happy, a golden age in which gradually corruption had crept in until finally you reached the state of things which existed uh, at, a, at, a, at a later period. The, um, this, this sun site is mentioned in very unlikely sources, even in the Christian New Testament, where there is a reference to the, to the sun which shines on the just and on the unjust. All these revolutionary movements, therefore, were backward looking. They looked back to an age of gold. They did not look forward. They hoped to, to, re to, 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 by overthrowing their ruling classes and by overthrowing the existing states, they hoped to get back to a golden age which had preceded, the, uh, preceded these states. In actual fact, of course, this was a, a, a utopian way of looking back to a primitive society in which classes had not developed. And we know that the reason why classes have not developed was because there was, wasn't sufficient wealth to afford a surplus for any class to possess. The, um, the, among very primitive societies today, for example, like the Eskimo, the Pygmies and the Congo and so on, the state of things probably still exists. And uh, in antiquity, of course, at the, in the earliest periods, it was practically universal. With the development of the, of the monarchies and the states and, the, and ruling classes and great differences in wealth and poverty and so forth, uh, people began to look back to, to, to this age as an age of gold. And uh, the, the revolutionary movements of antiquity were mostly, mostly concerned with, with trying to bring it to bar. Um, this, this 
point of view was made, has been mentioned by modern Marxists. For example, Lenin, Lenin remarked somewhere that there were two kinds of communism, the communism which capitalism destroys and the communism which destroys capitalism. The, the communism which capitalism destroys was precisely this primitive uh, pre, uh, um, pre-class society which existed in very early times and which in the third world, or at least until quite recently, was still quite, quite extensive. And we know, we know how capitalism has wiped this out, destroyed it, and uh, imposed capitalist methods of production uh, upon the primitive peoples. Another, another point must also be mentioned in connection with all these revolutions, uh, one which is particularly relevant when we come to the Uber Spartacus, and that is that the, the only historians belong to the ruling class. A ruling class history is usually very anti-revolutionary. Um, uh, we remember that uh, the Victorian writer Samuel Butler, for example, once remarked that um, uh, God cannot alter the past, so he made historians. And uh, this witticism is uh, very true even today, as we've seen recently in reference to the Hitler diaries. Uh, the historians of antiquity uh, were almost invariably opposed to, to revolutionary movements. If there were, as there possibly might have been, a few writers who gave an impartial account or uh, even a sympathetic account of the risings in Sicily, in Pergamus, in ancient Egypt, and last of all, the Great Spartacus Revolution. The, 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 the writings of these historians has not come down to us. All the writings that have come down to us are nearly all heavily biased in favor of the ruling class. Therefore, if they say anything good about Spartacus, for example, or if they mention any brilliant victory gained by the slaves, you can be quite sure it was good and it was a brilliant victory because they wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. Um, this, this, is a, a, this is a state of things which makes the study of revolutionary history and antiquity extremely difficult. When, for example, I wrote my book on Spartacus, I had, I had to very largely rely upon my own imagination because uh, the actual historical accounts are very rare and they are all violently biased and in, in many cases probably very inaccurate. And you have therefore to, uh, uh, to pr- produce a certain amount of rational thinking uh, in order to obtain a more a fairer perspective. Having Mr. Chairman made these general remarks, I will now come down to deal, at least briefly, with some of the earlier h- historical risings which took place in the centuries before Christ. Uh, there was, it is true, a, a very ancient social revolution in ancient Egypt, which is mentioned, I believe, in a modern papyrus which was dug up in Egypt a few years ago. But I don't know very much about it, and I, I don't suppose the writer knew. And the writer was, was obviously very biased against the rising, and we don't know how long it lasted, as far as I know, and, and whether it produced any serious result, results. It was only when you come down to Greek and Roman times, when you get an extensive literature, uh, that you begin to get some definite information about the sort of risings that took place. And therefore we find that uh, all the risings which I will deal with were were risings which took place under or in connection with the Roman Empire. A brief word must be said first about the political and social and economic development of the ancient world in the three or four centuries before the Christian era during which these risings took place. A uh, beginning with the ancient Egyptians and the, and the kingdoms of Assyria and Babylon and so on, powerful monarchies arose with large armies, ruling classes, and great differ- differences in wealth and poverty, all based upon the labor of an ex- extensive labor of a slave class. There is a reference, for example, in the, Ju- in the Jewish Old Testament to the, the slavery of the, of the Israelites in ancient Egypt. I don't know how far this is historically accurate, but there was nothing impossible in it. Uh, 
The last and most powerful of these empires was the Roman Empire, which started as a small Italian republic, probably somewhere about the 8th century BC, and by about the beginning of the Christian era, had, had overrun the whole of the Mediterranean, the great sea of antiquity, as it was usually called, described, and conquered an enormous empire, which extended uh, from, from Scotland uh, to, to the Indian Ocean. Uh, this, this very powerful empire was based upon the most ruthless exploitation of slavery. Every time the Romans conquered a rival state, they sold the inhabitants into slavery. When, for instance, they destroyed Carthage in 146 BC, it is estimated that something like a quarter of a million Carthaginians were sold into slavery. The, uh, when Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, a few years after this party was rising, it's estimated that something like a million Gauls uh, became slaves. And a huge, a huge army of slaves from every part of the Mediterranean, belonging to all classes in society, because the Romans enslaved rich and poor quite impartially, uh, a huge uh, mass of slaves existed all around the Mediterranean. It was from, the, it was from this mass of conquered slaves that the first slave risings took place. The, um, there were several earlier ones before the Spartans rising. Uh, for example, uh, there, was, there was one, uh, which is very significant, in ancient Greece, which was led by the kings of Sparta in the third century BC. This is very significant because one normally does not associate kings with, with, with the social revolutions, particularly revolutions which aimed at some form of primitive communism, as the Spartan one appears to have done. Uh, the kings of Sparta, or the red kings of Sparta, as some writer rather wittily described them, uh, the kings of Sparta were supposed to be dis were the oldest dynasty in Greece, and they were supposed to be descended from the god Hercules. It certainly would seem rather peculiar today if um, a descendant of Alfred the Great, for example, was to place himself at the head of a Trotskyist movement. <laughs> but, but the, uh, it may of course happen, but it would appear uh, somewhat unlikely. The, it, it would also seem uh, ver ver very unlikely that a monarchy whose ancestors traced, were traced right, right back to the writings of Homer and so on would suddenly demand that private property should be abolished and a system of primitive communism should be established. Now this seems to have happened in the case of Spot. This, however, only indicates, what I've already stated, the enormous difference between revolutions in antiquity and revolutions in modern times. In antiquity, there were no there were, of course, there was technical developments, but they were very slow and they took place over a long period. It was the idea of progress, as the late Professor Bury remarked, started, in, in its, in, started somewhere about the 16th or 17th century, when as a result of the development of printing and the development of uh, other modern discoveries and leading up to the Industrial Revolution, when these developed, the idea arose that society, as it gets, as it develops, gets better, and more progressive, more radical, and uh, more efficient. But in antiquity, there were, of course, as I said, changes. But the changes were very slow over very long periods, and uh, consequently, were, uh, as far as I know, no one put forward the idea, say in 500 BC that in a thousand years' time, in 500 AD, uh, a golden age would have been realized. On the contrary, as I said, they all look back to a golden age. The uh, Greeks look back uh, to an age of gold, which was ruled over, uh, over by the god Saturn. The uh, Jews look back to the Garden of Eden, and there were various other interpretations, all pointing in the same direction. Now, um, the... Uh, the Spartan kings attempted, apparently, about, in, in, about the year 200, to bring about uh, an, a utopian socialistic regime in, in, in Greece, and they waged war vigorously 
against the Roman Empire, which was beginning to extend its rule over that part of the world. The Roman Empire was too strong for them. They were eventually crushed, and all of them died violent death. A little later, about 130, the king of a, a, a kingdom called Pergamus in Asia Minor bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans, probably to prevent them conquering it. And um, his, one of his relations, Manco Aristonarchus, started a rising and, and demanded that the slaves should be freed and placed himself at the head of a slave rising. A very interesting point in this connection is that he, he founded a city which he called the City of the Sun. The sun being the symbol of equality, as I said, as I said previously. And all slaves who came to this city were liberated. And therefore, one might describe this perhaps as a slave revolt led by another king. Again, a rather peculiar state of things uh, from a modern point of view. However, again, the Romans were too strong, the, the rising was suppressed, and um, uh, the Romans took over the kingdom. Um, I, Shortly, about the same time, there were two very formidable revolutions separated by a very short period in the island of Sicily. The island of Sicily was one of the great agrarian centres of Roman imperialism. It was a great corn, it was a great corn centre and uh, was highly developed from a social point of view. And uh, very large numbers of slaves were employed on the big, huge latifundi or great estates into which Sicily was divided. Uh, about 120 BC, a, a rising started, led by a man called Eunice, who called himself Antiochus, king of Sicily. And uh, again, we had the same, the same period, the, uh, the, same, the same results. The uh, a utopian communistic regime was installed, a, a private property was abolished, but the Romans intervened and very shortly suppressed uh, suppressed the rising, as they did another one a few years later. When, when we turn to the Spartacus rising, which I shall deal with in a minute, uh, we find that that was closely connected because Spartacus made a tremendous effort to reach Sicily, and had he done so, would probably have held out there for a long time because with a, with a powerful army and with a brilliant guerrilla fighter as Spartacus was, he could probably have maintained himself in Sicily for a considerable period. However, we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, the, the, great, the Spartacus slave rising is the only one of these risings which is at all familiar today, which, is still, which has had a worldwide influence, which is still repeated, and the name of which is still familiar. Even football clubs are now called after Spartacus. <laughs> uh, the, um, the rising itself uh, took place in between 73 and 71 BC. And the word must be added on the, on the conditions prevailing at the time. The, um, Italy by this time had been entirely subjected by Rome. The Romans divided Italy into huge estates, all manned by slave labor. And these slaves were of course a very big lot because they were brought from practically every country around the Mediterranean which Rome had conquered. Gauls, Spaniards, uh, Asiatics, Africans, and so forth. Uh, the, um, <coughs> the, um, among, the, uh, among the Romans, the strongest and most active prisoners of war were usually spared manual labor and transformed into gladiators. Because as is common knowledge, the Romans were a very bloodthirsty people. And they, uh, instead of having games like football and cricket and tennis and so on, they, they went in for gladiatorial games, which gladiators fought each other to the death in the arena. These gladiators were mostly prisoners of war, uh, many of them were military experience. Among them was a Thracian gladiator, Thrace is roughly equal to the modern Bulgaria, uh, a Thracian gladiator named Spartacus, uh, which appears to have been his real name. And he, he, he fought with, with a trident and net. Uh, the, the trident and net was used against the swordsman and so forth. Uh, the, um, uh, according, according to the very meagre information at our disposal, Spartacus uh, 
had originally been taken prisoner by the Romans, had managed to escape and become a brigand, and been recaptured and would have been put to death but for his extraordinary strength, which marked him out as a great, very successful gladiator. And strong and skillful gladiators fetched a very high pre price in the Roman arena. The antecedents of Spartacus were not, were not, are not very well known, but a few years ago, a German historian known as Ziegler, Professor Ziegler, I think he was a professor of Gottingen, if I remember correctly, uh, um, uh, made some researches and discovered that there was a Spartacus dynasty ruling a tribe called the Medi in Bulgaria. And this tribe took part in a war against Rome around about the year 80, or, the, or nine, a bit earlier, perhaps 85 or 90. And in which case, Spartacus could have been taken prisoner in that war. And, and brought uh, to Rome as a result of it. It's also quite possible, this is also quite possible, because as I pointed out previously, kings and princes often were revolutionaries in other days. Uh, they, they, uh, the kings of Sparta were the oldest kings in Greece, the king, the king of Pergamus led, led a revolution and so forth. And if Spartacus was actually the member of a, a ruling family in Thrace, that probably gave him a leading position among the slaves and would have facilitated him uh, becoming the commander-in-chief and uh, the head of the revolution. Any, anyway, the movement itself started, like many other famous movements, rather inconspicuously. It started, actually, uh, in a, by a riot in a gladiatorial school in the town of Capua, a very wealthy town near Naples. Uh, uh, according to this, according to the only explanation that we have, Spartacus and a band of gladiators killed the proprietor of the gladiatorial school and fled, uh, seized all the arms in the gladiatorial armory, fled from Capua and took up their position on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. On the way they defeated a troop of soldiers and, and uh, took over their arms. Establishing themselves on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius, they carried on a guerrilla war in the surrounding country. It is quite clear, and even the hostile historian, Roman historians admit, Spartacus must have been an ancient Che Guevara. He must have been a brilliant guerrilla fighter. He must have been a remarkable leader. And uh, as a result, his uh, movement grew very rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that the Romans eventually uh, were forced to take some notice of it. As a rule, they ignored slaves wherever possible and uh, sent an army against it. But this army arrived at the bottom of, uh, led by a man called Clod Clod Clodius Parker, led, uh, uh, arrived at the bottom of Mount Vesuvius and blocked all the exits to the mountain so as to starve the gladiators out. But Spartacus, or one of his followers, hit on the brilliant idea of knotting ropes of vine leaves and sliding down the, the, an accessible rock at the other side of the mountain, and coming round the mountain, uh, took the Romans by surprise and defeated them very easily, and uh, took over all their arms and so on. Uh, therefore, as I said in my book on Spartacus, that uh, 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 but, um, uh, a riot became a revolt. The revolt soon became a revolution because uh, as the Spartacus movement grew, slaves from all over Italy uh, fled from their estates and took, uh, and, uh, took up arms and joined Spartacus. Until finally he had a very large army, estimated by one historian as something like 80,000 men. One has, however, to realize that while quite a number of the slaves may have had some military experience, the bulk of them had very, had very little and in all probability, very little experience in the use of arms. The Roman army at that time was the strongest that the world had ever known up to that period. But fortunately for the slaves, most of, the, most of it was engaged in frontier wars, in, particularly in a war in Asia Minor against Mithridates, king of Pontus, who for many years waged a, a very long struggle against the Roman Empire. He was, he was like other leaders, he was eventually defeated and killed. The, um, the, um, the Roman, uh, the, the, as a result, therefore, in the early stages of 
The slaves only had to deal with the Roman militia, who probably weren't so formidable, and were sort of half part-time soldiers. And um, uh, Spartacus won a whole series of victories over them. Uh, things eventually reached such a pass that both the Roman consuls, the chief magistrates of the Roman Republic, uh, took the field against him. But they were completely defeated, their army was routed, and uh, a large number of Roman prisoners were taken. Uh, one, of, one of the historians of the Spartacus rising uh, relates with extreme fury that when Spartacus had, the, had defeated the, the consuls, he organized gladiatorial games and made the Roman prisoners fight as gladiators, which caused them the greatest possible fury among the arrogant uh, Roman ruling class. Uh, however, Spartacus himself was obviously uh, a man with a very good tactical brain. He was obviously a statesman as well as a soldier. And he realized that you couldn't possibly fight the Roman Empire forever. That the, when the Roman army came back from the frontier, the, 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 the struggle would be too unequal. So he marched north with the object of, apparently of crossing the Alps getting out of the Roman Empire and, and establishing the slave kingdom on the other side of the Alps. However, he got as far as the Alps, he defeated the Romans again in Lombardy, so near, near the modern Milan. But his, the slaves mutinied. They had no desire whatever to uh, uh, cross the Alps and to develop into wild countries. They wanted to return, sack Rome and the other side of the Romans and set up some kind of a slave kingdom like their predecessors had done in, in Sparta and in Sicily. Consequently, the, the, the slave army uh, in 72 okay, marched back, marched right the whole length of the Italian peninsula and threatened to capture Rome at one point. However, by this time, the, Romans, the Roman state was thoroughly alarmed. I mean, uh, uh, previous slave revolts had taken place a long way from Rome, but this one was right on the doorstep. So they uh, uh, appointed Crassus, an enormously wealthy multimillionaire, uh, as, a, as a dictator, and they recalled recall their armies from the frontier and, and, uh, and concentrated all their forces uh, against the rebels. Uh, the result was several very desperate battles in one of which at least Spartacus was defeated but managed to make a tactical retreat. Finally, however, he was driven by sheer force of numbers and discipline uh, right down to the extreme south of Italy, where he hit upon another brilliant idea, that was to cross into Sicily, where there had been two slave risings about 50 years previously, uh, about 120, and set up a slave kingdom in Sicily, whereas I think I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, there is no reason why, as far as one can see, he might not have been able to establish a slave kingdom which might have lasted for a considerable time. It, it was probably, it would have been virtually impossible for him to have overthrown uh, the Roman Empire on the mainland, but in a, in a place like Sicily it is quite possible that he could have held out for quite a long time. Uh, unfortunately, he was, he was double-crossed, or in other words, he was financially outmaneuvered. The only, the only ships he could get to cross the Straits of Messina, which are notoriously turbulent, was from a band of pirates who were operating in the neighborhood. And they agreed to transport, transport Spartacus's army. But the Roman government had the, financial, had the financial purse strings and bribed them with an enormous sum of money uh, to, to betray Spartacus and refuse to, to, to carry out their contract. As a result, the Spartacus army was marooned in the winter of 72-3 in the extreme south of Italy, in Calabria. But uh, uh, the Romans thought they had trapped, uh, trapped the slaves, and Crassus had an enormous ditch dug right across the Italian peninsula, which would, which would block any exit. So Spartacus had the sea on one side and the trench on the other, and the, the the Romans sat down and waited for the slaves either to die of starvation or surrender. But as I said before, Spartacus obviously was a brilliant guerrilla fight. He was obviously a man with a very fine tactical brain. And he managed to uh, 
uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, he managed to elude the Romans, uh, overpower the, the Roman guard, and uh, di uh, fill up the ditch, cross the ditch, and march north into Italy, hotly followed by the Romans. The last campaign, the campaign in the spring of 73, was obviously an extremely brilliant campaign. Now, unfortunately, we were never in the body, but it's obvious that Spartacus won several victories and uh, uh, probably had the slaves kept together, uh, they might have succeeded, if not of conquering Rome, at least of making their escape across the Alps. Uh, unfortunately, however, at this stage, you had, uh, you had what a modern historian, uh, C.L.R. James, has remarked in his book, The Black Jacobins, dealing with Haiti, is a very common feature in slave revolutions. You get divisions among the slaves. There were two or three of these uh, bodies of slaves broke away from the main army of Spartacus and set up pillaging and plundering on their own. So the Romans, acting on the principle of divide and rule, cut these forces to pieces uh, before concentrating against Spartacus. And one of these battles on the river Solaris was particularly desperate. There were only two, uh, only two survivors out of a slave army of approximately 10,000 men. But uh, by this time, the Roman legions were coming back from the, from the borders, and the combination of training numbers, discipline, and so forth was proving too strong. Spartacus, therefore, again, retreated into the mountains and started a, a guerrilla war. But again, the slaves refused to follow his, instru his instructions, which was the last hope, actually, of a slave insurrection. They insisted on coming out and giving battle. Probably they, were driven by, probably they were driven by starvation. And eventually they came down into the plain and attacked the main Roman army. Again, the result of the battle is, the result of the battle is known, but there are very few details. But it is clear that the, the, the regular Roman legions were too strong for these slaves. Uh, a body of 6,000 of them cut their way through and retreated uh, north. Spartacus himself was killed in the last desperate attempt to cut down the Roman general, uh, Crassus, and um, the uh, slave army was virtually destroyed. The 6,000 slaves who succeeded in, in making good their retreat were most unfortunate. They, they fell back on Spartacus's early idea of marching north to the Alps and crossing the Alps, but they were intercepted on the way by another Roman army coming back, and, uh, and, and the force uh, and the, slave, the remaining slaves were completely destroyed. The, the slave army of Spartacus obviously won many battles, and they obviously uh, terrorized the Roman ruling class. This is shown by a very interesting anecdote, which is mentioned by a later Roman historian, who of course, like all the others, was violently anti-slave, uh, anti uh, when he said that uh, uh, when children couldn't sleep, their mothers threatened them that Spartacus would come if they didn't behave themselves, which shows that Sp the name and fame of Spartacus must have lasted for a very long time. The uh, revolt, unquestionably, was a very formidable one. Uh, whether it had any chance of success is perhaps doubtful, but at least it, it was certainly the most formidable, uh, formidable revolution of antiquity. Now, Mr. Chairman, as uh, if, if, I, if anyone wants to ask detailed questions about the Spartacus Rising, I'll deal with them later, but there are a few other points I would like to make. The Spartacus Rising was not only an important military and political event, but it was also a, a very p important historical event. It had a very great influence on several subsequent movements in, in European history, both in antiquity and in modern times. Well, I would like to deal with a few of these very briefly. To, to take antiquity first, the, uh, the, first, the immediate impact of the Spartacus victories on the Roman Republic was to show the incompetence of the Roman aristocracy and the necessity uh, for a stronger and more centralized regime. There is no doubt, therefore, in my view, that the rise of Julius Caesar and his successors, which took place a few years later, was at least partly due to the Spartacus movement. 
the, uh, the, the Roman aristocracy realised the truth which was mentioned in modern times by one of Queen Victoria's Prime Ministers, Lord Melbourne, who in a moment of crisis said, uh, addressed a cabinet meeting and said, for God's sake, gentlemen, let us hang together, otherwise we shall hang separately. And uh, uh, the probability is that uh, something similar happened in the Roman Empire. Uh, it is, of course, well known that after some years of civil war, uh, Julius Caesar, who according to Arthur Kersler, uh, actually took part in the, in, the, in the final battle against Spartacus, so I don't, I don't know where he got the information from. Uh, they, um, uh, as a result of this, the, uh, uh, the empire of the Caesars came into existence, first as a military dictatorship and finally as an absolute monarchy. And you've got first Julius, then Augustus Caesar, Tiberius, Caligula and the others. Uh, I would say, therefore, that the Spartacus Rising, the fact that it came within a measurable distance of success and that it defeated several Roman armies, terrified the Roman, the Roman ruling class into uh, sinking their differences and submitting to the rule of a dictator. And therefore, you could say that Spartacus, uh, the Spartacus Rising had a considerable influence upon the later stages of Roman history. Another movement which developed a little later than Spartacus, and which is still with us at the present time, fortunately or unfortunately, was Christianity. And uh, there is no doubt, in my opinion, that the Spartacus movement had a very considerable influence on the origins of Christianity. Uh, after the fall, of, the fall of, uh, after the defeat of Spartacus, the Romans took a terrible revenge. They crucified six thousand slaves alive. On the road to Rome to Capua, which is about 150 miles long, on each side, slaves were hanging. 6,000 slaves were crucified with a single, with a single time. It was one of the most terrible, terrible uh, victories of counter-revolution ever known. You could compare it perhaps with the Paris Commune of modern times and so on. The, the, uh, it was a, a monstrous punishment, but uh, it had this effect. The cross was the symbol of slavery. A little later, a movement was developed, probably in Palestine, which said that its founder, Jesus, had been crucified and had saved mankind by being crucified. Whoever invented the idea that the cross, an instrument of torture and degradation and slavery, was the instrument of salvation, may not have been a good theologian, but he was a brilliant propagandist. Uh, the, the effect of this upon the slave class and that was very great. They, they might be crucified in this world, but the cross would open the way to a better world, life in the world to come. And I again repeat the, the, the definition of religion by Napoleon, which I quoted the previous time I spoke here, which in my opinion is the best definition ever given. Napoleon said, I don't regard religion as the mystery of the incarnation, but as the mystery of the social order. Once take away from the poor the idea there is another a future life with a different distribution of riches, and they will rise in revolution and cut the throats of the rich. The, um, the, the, the idea that the cross, the, the instrument of terror, which hung over the, uh, hung over the slave class all their lives, had been transformed into an instrument of salvation was, I said, a brilliant propaganda idea, and it undoubtedly played an important part in the success of Christianity in the centuries immediately after, after Spartacus. Therefore, you may say that two very important movements, the, um, Christian, the, the empire of the Caesars on the political field and the Christian religion in the ideological field, uh, were both of them influenced indirectly, but probably quite, quite effectively, uh, by this very formidable revolution. There's another, an, another point which is rather, perhaps rather more speculative. Was there any chance of the Spartacus revolution abolishing slavery? Most Marxist historians today would probably say no. Because they would say that the uh, the uh, ancient society wasn't technically sufficiently advanced, and if you hold a Marxist view of history, you must realise 
that uh, in order to bring about a socialist state, you have got to have a very advanced stage of social and economic development. The Romans in many, and Greeks in many ways were highly civilised, but technically they were, of course, far behind uh, the, the, the modern society. However, there is, in my opinion, there is some evidence that an industrial revolution was just around the corner about that time. Uh, I, I quote uh, an example. About 100 years BC, about a generation before Spartacus, some unknown genius invented the water mill. A contemporary Greek poet wrote a poem, which I've read, in which he saluted the water mill consciously as a, a labour-saving device, saying that the, the unfortunate slaves who'd had to, uh, to uh, d d d drag the water up previously would no longer have to do it, and it would be performed by machinery. At the same time, there was a Roman scientist called Vitruvius who made a lot of suggestions with regard to development of machinery. It is a possibility, in my opinion, that an industrial revolution could have developed at that time. The reasons it didn't, uh, they were uh, complex, but the, probably the most important was the system of slavery, which is entirely opposed to any mechanical development. The slave is kept in poverty and ignorance, and in order to develop a technology, you require knowledge and so forth. That is why uh, the uh, ruling classes of modern times uh, have had to educate the proletariat, which they would not have done if they could have helped it, because every, if they had been completely uneducated, their prospects of acquiring political information would have been considerably less. Uh, therefore, it seems to be a possibility that had Spartacus succeeded in overthrowing the Roman state, which he came within a reasonable distance of doing apparently at one point, uh, the, uh, it, 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 it could conceivably have happened that the Industrial Revolution might have developed. And had that happened, the whole history of mankind, or the whole history of the last 2,000 years, would, of course, have been entirely different. Naturally, uh, modern English writers, who are Englishmen first and historians afterwards, would be horrified at the idea that any revolution could start, any industrial revolution could start outside Yorkshire and Lancashire. But uh, it, it seems to me it might have been a possibility. Anyway, to, to, uh, these examples are sufficient to show that the, the slave risings, of which that Spartacus was the last and the most important, had a very considerable influence on the de development on the course of subsequent ancient history. Well, as we know, the ancient empire eventually disappeared. It, it couldn't develop an industrial revolution. And um, um, it, um, uh, it remained stagnant and uh, in its ancient forms. It decayed and was finally destroyed, partly by barbarian invasions and partly <coughs> <coughs> partly by internal decay. Uh, Gibbon spent the greater part of his life writing a huge work describing it in six volumes. He met a member of the royal family in the course of this, a member of the royal family who seems to have been about as intelligent as some of the present months, remarked, still scribbling, Mr. Gibbon. Um, the, uh, the, uh, when we come down to modern times, we also find that, that the name and fame of Spartacus uh, are, are still known. As I said before, the Russians describe, call football clubs after Spartacus today, but there are more revolutionary activities than that. Uh, at, the, at the time of the French Revolution, there was a, a, free, a, free, a free Masonic sect called the Illuminati, who were led by an ex-Jesuit called Adam Weishaupt, who assumed the title of Spartacus. And he wrote a number of pamphlets, I, I must admit I haven't read them, but he wrote a number of pamphlets uh, under that pseudonym, pseudonym of Spartacus. Uh, but of course, in modern times, the most famous example was the Spartacus rising in Germany at the end of the First War, which was the failure of which was epoch-making. Because had Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht and the Spartacists succeeded in overthrowing <coughs> the uh, uh, social democratic regime at that time, in my opinion, it's at least a 50-50 chance that the Russian Revolution would have spread over Western Europe. The capitalist class, as I can remember myself at that time, were taken completely by surprise. 
If that had happened, therefore, the history of Europe since the Russian Revolution would have been very different. And Germany in particular would have been spared the monstrous uh, interlude of fascism, of Nazism and Hitler, which represented the a temporary decline into barbarism by a country which most of the 19th century revolutionaries, including Karl Marx, had regarded as the most civilized in Europe. Uh, therefore, one sees that in modern times, also, the Spartacus rising had, a, had a considerable uh, repercussions. Its name and fame still exist. It, uh, uh, several remarkable novels have uh, been written in modern times uh, on the subject. The late Arthur Kersler, who was regretted death, we all remember a few weeks ago, uh, wrote a very good one called The Gladiators. Uh, the best, in my opinion, was written a few years earlier by a man called Leslie Mitchell, whom I never met, but I, know pe I knew people who knew him. He, he died quite young, but he, it's an extremely brilliant novel. I don't know whether it's still in circulation. It's called Spartacus. An uh, extremely brilliant novel. The uh, novel of Hard Fast, in which the film is makes, <coughs> in my opinion, it's good journalism, but if the film is anything, if the film is anything like I haven't read the novel, but if the film which I have seen is anything like it, it's grossly inaccurate. Spartacus wasn't crucified, and he didn't work in a, in a gold mine in Africa, and well, you could spend the rest of the evening talking about mistakes in the, in the film. But um, the uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that Spartacus was undoubtedly a very important revolutionary. Not only was he a, probably a military genius, a brilliant guerrilla fighter, and a statesman with a tactical sense, he, not only a man who led a very formidable rising, uh, but he also, his, his movement and the earlier movements preceding him, uh, represent links in the long chain of, of revolution. The, the chain of revolution that began with the formation of class society, which will, we hope, end in a world revolution which will make revolution unnecessary by abolishing its causes, by abolishing its causes. Its causes, of course, being poverty, class dictatorship, and, and the misery and degradation that follow. Spartacus may have been unable to have done this, but his, his name and his fame and the movement that he led and the movements preceding him are a part of that huge link, a link which continued with Mont Tyler and the peasants rising in the Middle Ages, uh, and which has <coughs> developed in recent centuries in modern times. Thank you. Are you ready to take some questions? Right? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Leslie? Yes, yeah, well, uh, uh, this was a magnificent lecture by Isaac Lee on Slavery. One little incident that he didn't mention, uh, I suppose, because he covered such a broad field, was that in in this country there was the rising of Boadicea. Uh, that was a queen, strangely enough. Uh, I wonder if you care to elaborate on that now. That you or speak on the rising or. of Boadicea. Uh, the rising of Burgess is, no, I think I'd better not, because it wasn't really a slave rising. It was a colonial rising, but I wouldn't call it a slave rising. The Romans, well, I'll say a few words if you like. The, Roman, <coughs> the Romans conquered Britain in 43 AD. Among the tribes they conquered was a tribe called the Iceni in modern East Anglia, of whom Burgess was the queen. Um, the Romans laid heavy taxes on the, Brit on the Britons, which proves, incidentally, that they weren't slaves because the slaves didn't pay taxes and they hadn't got any resources to pay them with. They, uh, they, but they, they laid very heavy taxes on them, and uh, around about the year 60, uh, they doubled these taxes. Rather interestingly, the man who was responsible for doubling the taxes was Seneca, who was one of the most famous Roman philosophers, who was a do-gooder, always talking about universal brotherhood and so forth. Uh, but uh, he farmed out the taxes in Britain, and as, as a result of these heavy taxes, there were a lot of uh, movements uh, against the Romans uh, among the Iceni and the Britons. The Romans reacted brutally by arresting Boadicea and uh, flogging her and uh, uh, breaking up her palace and imprisoning her family. 
the uh, Berta Seerhoff, a seems to be a very remarkable woman, she managed to escape somehow and placed herself at the head of a rising, which was joined not only by the Iceni, but by a large number of other tribes as well. The, uh, it is probably, in my opinion, though I have no evidence for this, and, and my friend Leslie Jones will have to realise that I am a historian and therefore I'm up to falsify the truth. Uh, the, uh, in my opinion, the, it's very probable that the, the rising was organised by the Druids. The, the Druids were the powerful Celtic priesthood in Britain who, would, who practically dominated British society before the Romans arrived. And they were very anti-Roman. They, um, uh, their headquarters were in Anglesey, or one of their headquarters was in Anglesey, and the Roman governor of Britain at that time, Suetonius Paulinus, had withdrawn the majority of the Roman army in Britain for an expedition against Anglesey, which ended <coughs> in the destruction of the Druid temples and the, uh, the wiping out of the Druid order. In his absence, Bordesia raised a very formidable rising. She sacked London, which was already a quite flourishing commercial town, and several other towns, and, uh, uh, but finally and defeated at least one Roman army. Uh, the historian Tacitus, who was uh, father-in-law was, was one of the Roman officers, uh, admits in, his, in one of his historical works uh, that uh, Bordes here very nearly succeeded in driving the Romans out of Britain. Uh, one might perhaps make a parallel with the so-called Indian mutiny or the War of Indian Liberation, as they call it in Indian knowledge, um, which very nearly succeeded in driving the British out of India. But eventually, the, the the superior discipline and organisation of the Romans, who of course were a great, great military nation, uh, was too strong, and Bodice's army was defeated, and she was either killed or committed suicide, and uh, the uh, the rising was suppressed. I think that's a, it's a very brief summary, but I think it's about all I got time for. It, I wouldn't call it actually a slave rising in the ordinary; it was a colonial rising, rather than a slave rising. Well, I was interested. Remarks about the possibility of a sort of pre industrial revolution because it's always struck me that this sort of revolution, even if unsuccessful, always seems to come at a point at which different class societies seem to meet. For example, Spartacus came from Thrace, and we're assured by modern Bulgarian historians that the Thracian society never developed a slave, slave society, it was still a sort of patriarchal style of society that Greece had before, uh, before Homer. Now, and Crassus, one of the people who helped to defeat Spartacus Sound, was well known as a money bags. And when the Parthians finally killed him in his invasion of Parthia, they made a point of pouring gold into his eyes. Uh, now, the Parthians had a sort of mailed knight sort of uh, society, almost pre feudal. Taking it a bit further, his other opponent, Pompey, got his head chopped off by the last of the Ptolemies, who, of course, uh, is the descendant of an old Oriental despotism. So here in the sort of Spartacus period, we've got several forms of class society all meeting. And it's always struck me that people that have the theory of automatic succession of class societies, slave followed by people and so on, really haven't understood just how complicated ancient history is, as well as the history of more modern times. Could you comment on the fact that so, so many sort of styles of society were in the melting pot, either on the way up or on the way down, and perhaps connect this with the Spartacus rising, particularly in view of did you hear much of that, Frank? Not very well, no. Could you comment on the various forms of social structures that existed at the time of Spartacus? Is that very forms of water? Does that. No, could you just repeat re what you want Frank to comment on? Well, very quickly, very quickly, Frank, um, you mentioned the possibility of a sort of pre-industrial revolution with the bringing of the water wheel. Um, what the point I'm trying to make is, um, could you comment on the time in the Spartacus Rebellion in view of the way that society was developing? Roman slave society about to be frozen into stagnation. The society Spartacus himself came from, which was an old patriarchal pre-Greek style, mm. and the societies that the Roman Empire was at that present in conflict with. 
the one in Egypt, for example, and the one in Parthia, one of them an ancient Oriental oh, yeah. society, the other one an up and coming semi feudal setup. Could you explain how these systems, whether, in your opinion, the different things that were happening in different parts of the world at that time helped with the oh, times? Well, the main, the main, uh, the main uh, difference, as far as I know, of the Roman slavery from earlier forms of slavery was the Romans uh, had vast uh, latifundia or huge estates and employed armies of slaves and sort of collective labour, and this uh, gave opportunities for an organised, some kind of an organised rising. Uh, the, uh, incidentally, the uh, the the only the only successful slave rising in modern times, uh, that of Toussaint Louverture in Haiti, was a rather similar state. The, the French uh, had huge plantations in Haiti with armies of Negro slaves and, uh, and so forth. The, um, as far as the uh, uh, system of slavery was concerned, it was, it was, I suppose, in a sense universal, though in some parts of it, the Western world, it was less prevalent than others. I mean, among the, I'm not an expert in Jewish history, but I, as far as I know, it, among the Jews, uh, a, pe a peasantry, uh, uh, an, uh, an agrarian peasantry, was more common than, than, than a slave class. So there were slaves, of course. Um, as far as the uh, the earlier risings were concerned, of course, uh, ancient Egypt was the, as my friend knows quite well, was the, much better than I do, was the, uh, was the classical example of a, an absolute state, a state where the uh, pharaoh was the absolute monarch of the, the country, and the, uh, the whole population were slaves in a sense. But um, I really don't know enough about the early Egyptian history to say much about that. The, um, the, uh, in general, I would say that the uh, that the whole the ancient society culminated in the Roman Empire, and the institutions of ancient society, which of which slavery was a very prominent one, also culminated in the Roman Empire. And therefore, it is not uh, it is not really very surprising that the most important slave risings took place at that particular time. Uh, you mentioned the uh, impact. Can you hear me? Can you, no. uh, you may mentioned the impact of the defeat of the Spartans rising on the um, possible development of Christianity. You know. um, but you would, would you distinguish between the colonial uprising that took place in Palestine against the uh, Romans? From, with the, would you distinguish that from the uh, slave rising of Spartanism? Would you think there was any? Um, Interconnections that were between the Spartacus rising and the effects of well, uh, colonial risings of Palestine. Uh, one has already in, uh, in existence a, a very powerful account of it. I refer to the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse of St. John the Divine, the last book of the Christian New Testament. How it ever got into the Christian New Testament, only God knows. If there is no God, no one knows. I don't. Uh, the. Uh, the um, According to the Book of Revelation, a celestial Spartacus or a heavenly uh, Messiah, <laughs> at the head of a celestial army, comes down from heaven and does on in heaven what Spartacus tried to do on earth, <laughs> and, and does it successfully. He wipes the Roman Empire completely out. And there is, I think, as far as I remember, it's just quite a long time since so I read the work in question. I think I remember he actually refers to slaves as one of the great evils. Of the, of the Roman Empire. The, the, the book obviously shows that the Jews, who were not, as I said, normally uh, slaves, but who were a, definitely a colonial people, that the, the Jews hated the Romans with a deadly hatred. And the, there's no doubt, too, that the colonial, the colonial risings, if one could perhaps call them of the period, were very sympathetic to slave risings. For instance, it is stated by one historian, I can't remember which one at the moment, that uh, uh, Mithridates, king of Pontus, who was an absolute monarch in the East and was engaged in a prolonged war against Rome, sent an embassy to Spartacus and proposed a peace treaty. I didn't mention this in my book because the evidence doesn't seem very strong, but it's a possibility anyway. The, uh, the, slave, the slave rising 
that the slave risings were aimed at the overthrow of, of the ruling class rather than at the abolition of slavery. And therefore, I'm afraid it's, it's quite possible that had Spartacus succeeded, uh, he or at least his successors might have ended up in place of Caesar, and Caesar and his successors might have ended up in the place of Spartacus. I mean, it, it, the Spartacus slavery system might have really ended up in a new form of uh, imperialist uh, mastery. Of course, we don't know that, so we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, uh, the all, the, all the races around the Mediterranean hated the, Jew, hated the Romans because uh, they had every reason to do it. The Romans uh, plundered and robbed and, and massacred all, all, all over the place. I mean, the, when Masada, the last uh, uh, Jewish fortress in the first, uh, first Jewish war of 66 to 73, when Masada fell, we, it was already recognized that the whole, the whole garrison committed suicide. And uh, the uh, the book of Revelation can be called, really, as a secondary, a secondary title, as a hymn of hate against the Roman Empire. The, the author probably wasn't a slave, but he was, he was a, the member of a conquered colonial race, the same as Bodicea, with whom was rising we've already looked at. How far do you think this Spartacus idea will extend to To what extent were the slave risings political? Were they not perhaps more like strikes over conditions? Well, of course, I suppose the slaves rose because, uh, in the first instance, because they were they were beaten, ill-treated. The Roman slavery was extremely brutal, and they, were, they probably uh, they, they probably had immediate reasons for rising. But when they got to the stage of having assembled an army and won a few battles and so on. They probably did develop political ambitions. Spartacus, for instance, was quite obviously a man of, 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 great, of great ability. Not only a brilliant guerrilla fighter, but he's obviously got a very good tactical brain. And the probability is that he, uh, he intended, either in Sicily or the other side of the Alps, to set up some sort of a slave kingdom. Whether, whether it would have abolished slavery is another matter, but no, it didn't happen, so we don't know. Uh, it's, it's fairly clear that Spartacus himself, though not his followers, realized quite early that they couldn't overthrow the Roman Empire. It was too strong for them, Roman Republic. But the, as I said, had he got across to Sicily, as he could have done quite easily if the, if the pirates had been a bit more sensible. I mean, the, the, the pirates betrayed him, but they were extremely foolish because a few years later the Romans destroyed them. But um, they, um, had, he, had he been able to get across to Sicily and conquer it, he, he might have, held, he might have held, held out there for quite a long time. Uh, it might have been a slave kingdom that lasted for a considerable period. There are several similar examples in history. Uh, similarly, if he crossed the Alps, he might have established some kind of a kingdom on the other side of the Alps. Uh, but as I say, the, I'm afraid, if you consider what the conditions were in the first century BC, it is more likely that the slaves would have become Romans and the Romans would have become slaves. But th there are some other possibilities. Uh, as I, I mentioned before, that there were uh, utopian philosophers in antiquity. There was a book called The Sun State, written by a man called Iambulus, which seems to have had a considerable circulation. And uh, the idea of, a, uh, of a, a free society without slaves was not unknown. The only point was the Stoic philosophers, for example, made a point of it. But they, they all, of course, put it in the distant past and not in the future. And whether they would have attempted to bring it about, nobody can say. The probability is that they wouldn't have done. The probability is that had Spartacus won a few battles, conquered Sicily and won a few battles, uh, he would have become a sort of a sort of glorified Caesar, and his successors would have either been conquered by the Romans or would have conquered the Romans, or anything might have happened. Yeah. I, have, uh, I thought that this play by Spartacus was very interesting. 
Is this, I mean, do, can, is this part of the Sparky Coon or what is it? Why? Is it something, you haven't mentioned this particular... Oh, it's about to say slave. No, I mean, I've vaguely heard of its existence, but I, I'm afraid I don't know any more about the Spartacus League than Spartacus did. <laughs> it seems to be a Marxist universe. Well, I dare say, it, it probably there'd be several Spartacist movements. I mean, yes, the yes. most famous one I mentioned, the one after the end of the First World yeah, War, yes. headed by Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht. There have been others, there's one of my shorts, which also mentioned, and other, probably others that didn't. And uh, I, I'm very pleased to hear there are Spartacists at the present time. I hope they don't end by being crucified. <laughs> um, what the point that I want to make is, um, do, 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 um, do you as a Marxist see Spartacus um, as a Marxist forerunner or just part of the uh, ancient revolutionary um, picture? These are very highly hypothetical questions exactly. which you can pass the brain of Karl Marx himself to answer. Yeah. But uh, if you want my personal opinion, uh, I don't uh, think Spartacus was a forerunner of Marx because I never heard he wrote Capital or the Communist Manifesto or anything like that. Uh, there may have been some Marxist philosopher or pre-Marxist philosopher or proto-Marxist philosopher, whatever you like to call it, in the Spartacus army. That's quite a possibility. But they haven't come down to the Well, they wouldn't, of course, naturally. I mean, as I... Uh, I well, look here, my dear sir, allow me to remind you of... Uh, admirable remark of Samuel Butler who wasn't a Marxist but was a highly intelligent man when, when he said that uh, uh, God can't alter the past so he made historians and uh, the historians alter the past very effectively and class historians who were dealing when they deal with slave revolutions or any kind of revolutions for that matter uh, also alter history very effectively including that of the modern Spartacists incidentally and uh, Therefore, I mean, uh, I admit that the probability is that uh, uh, any Spartacist movement that exists in modern times will not get a very sympathetic hearing, shall we say, from Professor Trevor Roper or somebody of that kind. What about the Spartacus Diaries? About what? The Spartacus Diaries we've got to find. The Spartacus Diaries? <laughs> I don't get it. What? Hypothetical question. What about the Spartacus Diaries we've to find? Spartacus what? <laughs> Spartacus diaries we've yet to find. Oh, well, the Spartacus diaries, the Spartacus diaries are probably being written, probably for something in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope if they if they if they do write them, they acknowledge my lectures, one of their sources. <laughs> I hope the Peter will have some more questions, but. Uh, I just want to point out anyway that Leslie has uh, a selection of works by Frank for sale over there and some additional works and also a little... I would say that all the F.A. Ridley complete collected works very cheaply I should say that they're not really his collected works since he has about 30 odd publications in the British Museum. Uh, Leslie also has a cup for donations because we do have to pay for the room. So the, people can <laughs> the thing I'd like to ask. Um, uh, I've read, just read Coastal's book. Since he died, actually, I've had it for years with the gladiators. Now, in it, uh, for quite a period, I don't know how long the, the, the rising took, but they did actually build a town, and he did try to implement some of these sun ideas that you mentioned. Uh, was it for very long, and was it uh, a, a sort of utopia? Uh, it's a very long time since I've read the novel of Arthur Cook. I have read it, but it's a very long time ago, about four years, I think, actually. It's quite a long time. And uh, I, I don't really remember it very well. The, um, I was less, I, the, the novel on Spartacus, I, I can give you a list if you want of pretty well everything written on Spartacus, because I think I've read everything that's ever been written on him, except a work in Russian, which I can't read. But uh, I've read several German works that have been translated, and. Uh, there's one French work I haven't read, but I've read another work by the same author. It's pure journalism. I can't imagine it's much value. But uh, 
as far as the novels of Spartacus was concerned, I thought the best of them was the one of Leslie Mitchell. Of course, uh, Leslie Mitchell was, uh, great, uh, he wrote it in about 1933, I think, or somewhere around about that. He, he died soon after, unfortunately. And uh, it was a very powerful novel. I don't know it's still in circulation. It was called Spartacus. Very dynamic. Kersler, of course, was more of a, Kersler, of course, Arthur Kersler, of course, more of a philosopher. I mean, he probably, he gives actually, as far as I do remember, he, he had a dialogue the night before the final battle between Crassus, the Roman general, and, and Spartacus. And uh, he puts, uh, Crassus puts, it's quite a good Marxist, he puts quite a good Marxist case. He points out that civilization depends on the, on the production of, of mass, of mass production, that the Romans are only the only technology, I'm putting it in modern terms, the only technology available, that the slaves were massive savages for the most part, and that the, 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 when the Roman Empire was defending themselves, they were also defending ancient civilization. In fact, he talked just like Tre Professor Trevor Robin. Yeah, from the back. Is it possible Can you that, uh, did he stand up and speak sorry. up, sir? Is it possible that Jesus Christ had, had heard of uh, um, Spartacus? Uh, that raises very vast questions, which would, uh, if I started at six o'clock, I should probably finish them about midnight. So I, uh, I wouldn't, but I'll reply briefly. Um, I would rather doubt it myself. The, uh, the Christian, when the, the Christians, are, the first Christians are supposed to have arrived in Rome about the year 40, Anno Domini, and uh, a few years after uh, they are mentioned in the contemporary literature. Uh, the, the spy, these Christians who were in Rome were probably slaves, so they must have heard of Spy. Whether, the, whether the, early, uh, the early Christians in Palestine and uh, uh, that area had heard him is, I should say, very doubtful. Uh, as for Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, I really, were, I, I really couldn't say. Uh, some people w would say he didn't exist. I don't go as far as that. I think probably somewhere along the line you'd probably find a Jesus. It's a, contra it's a very controversial question. But... Uh, uh, <coughs> it, it, one thing is fairly clear that the origins of Christianity were mixed up with some kind of a revolution. They're not, probably not a slave revolution, a colonial revolution. Um, I, I give a few, a few examples taken at random. Um, when, Christ, when Jesus and his followers went on the Mount of Olives they were, uh, and the, the temple police arrived to arrest Jesus, Peter drew his sword and smote off the ear of the high priest. As the Marxist historian Karl Kautsky very aptly remarked, people don't usually carry swords at prayer meetings. Um, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, which is the, the most authentic, or least unauthentic of the four Gospels, uh, there's a definite reference to the insurrection, the with a definite particle. There must have been some kind of insurrection. And as Kautsky points out in his book, The Foundations of Christianity, which uh, it's a very able monstrous work on the subject, that the, uh, if it is true that Jesus sees the temple and threw the money changes out, which is stated in the Gospels, he can't have done it single-handed because the temple was heavily protected both by, uh, both by the temple police and by a Roman garrison stationed at the Tower of Antonia close to it. And he must have had a considerable force with him to have done it. All, these are probably straws, the straws in the wind. Uh, they're not definite evidence, but they seem to point in the direction that there was some kind of a, an insurrection. Another point which could be quoted in that is that Jesus Christ, according to all the four Gospels, was crucified as a... As a was crucified. He wasn't stoned. If he'd been a religious heretic, he'd been stoned to death, because that was a Jewish punishment, and the Romans didn't interfere normally in, in religious questions. Crucifixion, on the other hand, was a punishment reserved for slaves for slaves and rebels exclusively. And therefore, it is possible that the Romans at least thought that Jesus had been mixed up with some kind of a revolt. That could be also supported by the fact that it is probable that if Jesus didn't call himself a Messiah, some of his, support, his supporters did, and the Messiah, the kingdom of the Messiah, was anti-Roman. According to the Jews, 
the Messiah was to become king of Palestine in both the secular and in the religious sense. That meant he had to throw the Romans out first in order to do so. According to one, one interpretation of one parable, which in one of the Gospels, I can't remember which at the moment, uh, uh, um, we are told that Jesus cast the uh, cast out the cast devils uh, into the Gadarene swine who rushed into the sea. Now, um, uh, it, this is followed by a significant remark: <coughs> "He that has ears to hear, let him hear." In other words, there's a crypto meaning to this. Well, uh, the Roman garrison in Palestine at that time was the Tenth Legion. Whose, whose regimental arms were a boar or a, 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 a swine. And uh, it, is, it has been put forward by the late Mr. Archibald Robertson, particularly some years ago, that uh, when Jesus talked about the, about the swine being cast into the, the devil being cast into the swine who rushed into the sea, this was a cryptic way of saying that urging his followers to drive the Romans out of Palestine because the Roman legion was the legion of the swine, it was the legion of the boar. I, I, I mention these as <coughs> possibilities to show. The early Christianity may have had something to do, not with the slave revolution, but with the colonial revolution. In that case, it's not impossible some of the more literate Christians could have heard of Spartacus. Whether Jesus did himself, I don't know. Uh, if he, uh, if he he knew everything, he must have known that, but he, he probably didn't. <laughs> yeah? Actually, I think it's highly likely that uh, they would have known about it in Palestine, because after uh, Crassus, Spartacus' enemy, had been defeated and killed by the Parthians, it was followed by a three-year invasion of Palestine, an occupation, in which the Parthians set up a puppet king. And I should imagine, therefore, the Parthian propaganda would have been something like, it's all right against fighting slaves, but when he comes up, comes up against the real army, well, the, uh, I should imagine that that sort of propaganda would have circulated around Palestine during that brief Parthian occupation between 40 and 37 BC. It's very difficult to know what goes on in what went on in the Roman catacombs and the underground Roman society because for some reason I've already mentioned that all the historians come from the ruling class and they took very little, very little interest in it. There may, of course, have been some literate Greek or Roman or something. In the, in, the, in the slave army of Spartacus who may have survived to write an account of it, but if so, it has completely disappeared. But then that's, not, that's not at all surprising. <clears throat> the few rationalistic works uh, which uh, were written in antiquity, uh, of this, uh, which have survived, have only survived by accident. The most famous of all of them, the poem of Lucretius on the, on the nature of the universe, is um, only survived in a single copy, showing that it survived by accident. The uh, uh, rather curiously, a modern Roman, famous modern Roman Catholic priest, Cardinal Newman, remarked once that any literature, any classical literature we have, we owe to the monks in the Middle Ages. And in a certain sense, that is true. The, uh, the monks exercised a very careful selection. They allowed those things to pass which went hostile to Christianity, but anything which was hostile to Christianity uh, would disappear. And as Christianity at that time was strongly opposed to revolutions, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Christi Christianity had become the religion of the ruling class, it is very doubtful if anything, that anything favorable to Spartacus or to anybody connected with Spartacus would have been allowed to develop, would have been tolerated. Well, surely, one would, one would imagine normal psychology, if you've got Roman soldiers drafted to Palestine, that they would gossip about this legend of Spartacus, presumably. They would be a sort of general voice throughout the Roman army. Well, they might have done, if you, assume it, if you assume that Jesus knocked about a Roman soldier. So generations before, not long before. Well, that was some of the early Christians. So, I mean, I, it's a hypothetical question. I mean, yeah. Some of the early Christians could have heard of him, but whether Jesus had ever heard of him, as I should say, Billy Darfur, he could have done, of course. It's a possibility. Check with his diaries. Yeah, well, uh, I'm eagerly waiting to see them. <laughs> I hope I don't write them. I hope they don't mention me in their index of authors consulted, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Anybody have any more questions? Okay, so no more questions, Frank. So thanks very much for coming down. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, are you willing to give the speech you mentioned at a f future date? Well, I, I, in a rash moment, I suggested that I could uh, give another lecture sometime on Win Stanley and the English Revolution, but I can't do it in the immediate future because, unfortunately, I'm under medical observation at the moment, and maybe sometime before I'm completely cleared. When I, if and when that happy event takes place, I'm very pleased to do. Yeah, so that we're hoping that that might be uh, in early September, a lecture on Win Stanley and the English Revolution. So hopefully you will come to hear that on that occasion. I wonder if I could just make one more point, small point, that is not important. But I have read um, that the ancient Assyrian, you know, they, they, which predated the Romans by, say, several, seven, seven, by 700 years, I believe, they, they were centered on modern Iraq, were, as, a, as a military force, more formidable, surprisingly enough, than the Roman army. But it was the strength of the of the Romans as a social organization. I mean, which, which helped them to resist not only, say, um, this um, Spartacus, but also Hannibal, who was also a very strong military yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the strength of the Romans, which was defeated in the slave revolt, as it defeated Hannibal, was their strength of, they weren't um, extraordinary um, they were a very good, strong military force, but it was primarily the strength of their social organization. Where the Assyrians disappeared from history when their army broke down, the sure, Romans yeah. could continue and withstand defeats from several brilliant generals in the course. Yes, I, I, as far as Hannibal was concerned, I go with you all the way. I mean, they, uh, there's no doubt he was a great general, and he, he would have, from a military point of view, he, he defeated the Romans repeatedly, but the social organization it probably was too strong for them, I'd agree with that. As far as the ancient Assyrians are concerned, they were a, a very ruthless r race. And if you want to know what the peoples of Asia thought about them, I can tell you. Uh, buy a copy of the Holy Bible, I've, I've quoted it once already, and look up the Old Testament, find the book of Joel, and Joel was contemporary of the fall of Nineveh, and it's, his book is a hymn of hate against the Assyrian Empire, the same as John in Revelation was a hymn of hate against the Roman Empire. Obviously, both these empires massacred, slaughtered, and ravaged, and devastated, and they were highly unpopular, uh, both with, with the slaves and with, uh, with other nations. Uh, as for the, their comparative military strength, I wouldn't like to say, but I doubt if the Assyrians were, were as advanced as the Romans were. Anyway, I should point out, Hannibal wasn't a Syrian, he was a Carthaginian, anyway. Oh, yes, a Carthaginian. Oh, yes, Hannibal was a very great general, wasn't it? Hannibal was one of the greatest. Yes, I'm just making the point that the Assyrians disappeared completely, and when they had suffered military defeats, when well, Rome, um, in the course of history, suffered considerable military defeats by great generals. Still have the strongest socialized organization to carry on, and that was the main strength of Rome, its social organization. And that's what defeated the. Well, there's one, one, one point I'd like to take up. You say uh, it's perfectly true the Romans, for the period they lived in, had a strong social organization, but all the information you get about the Roman organization comes from people who are extremely favorable to it. Again, we're quoting Butler's remark about historians. I mean, they, they, they used every opportunity they could to boost the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was on the winning side, and historians were nearly always snobs, and they're usually on the winning side. And this is particularly so in the case of the Roman Empire. There may have been other, other nations who were defeated by the Romans may have had equally good social organizations, but they were beaten, and nobody took the interest in them. But there's a point you should remember, the Romans were the winners. Loves well, I mean, Hannibal, Hannibal, if Hannibal, if Hannibal, for instance, if Hannibal, for example, had taken Rome, it's very they did off the Roman calendar and destroyed the Roman Republic, we should all, we should all be saying that Carthage was the greatest country the world's ever known, 
And if you couldn't pass the examination in Carthage, you to plowed and so on and so forth. But I mean, uh, the, the, the Carthage, Carthage lost. It had a horrible fate. It was destroyed by the Romans in 146, and the whole population was held into slavery. The city was burnt to the ground. But it was a very close thing. At one point, Hannibal was on the verge of conquering the Romans. This gentleman not make the point that the Romans really had a better ideology, a better reason for fighting in the Carthaginian War. How, how do you know? How do you know? They, they say that the slave that happens armor and all this, the uh, Hannibal's men were, were slave soldiers. He was a despot. He, the kind of society was, was despotic. Whereas you could argue, I don't know if there's any justice. The Romans with... had a republic in a bit more. You might say a bit more democratic uh, than the other side. With all, with all due respect, <laughs> with all so due respect, with all due respect, we know nothing, but know very little about the social organisation of Carthage and uh, other uh, other places because the Romans destroyed it. Uh, any native historian's works have almost completely disappeared. We know far more about the Romans than so they were the winners, and therefore everything is weighted in their favour. We, if the Romans won, they may have deserved to win because they had the best social organisation. It's a possibility, but we, it's not a certainty. We, we have no authorities on the other side to, to check it, just as in the wars between the Greeks and the Persians, for example. We, all the accounts are given by the Greeks. We have no Persian account for that. No? Okay, well, Christian from Al. No, I've just got a back up Frank on that. The constitution of Carthage was as much like the Roman constitution as the Roman constitution was to itself, so that argument wouldn't fall very well. The truth is a lot simpler. Rome depended for its army to begin with on its uh, Latin peasant soldiery, and it, at a, a certain time could draw the whole manpower of Italy. Carthage always went to war with large armies of mercenaries, that's why its armies were so damned expensive and it couldn't maintain long wars. And its losses weren't easily made up either, which Roman ones were. During that first Punic War, the population of Italy dropped by 10%, and it's not surprising. The Rome could neck up her losses, and Carthage couldn't. Okay, thanks very much. If you'd like to see Leslie on your way up. <laughs> <laughs>